Can you hear me now? Yeah. Good. Okay. All right. Welcome back, guys. So I'm going to be talking about a little bit more on AWS today. Hopefully, some of the stuff I talked about a little bit will shed some light on what I'm going to cover here. Uh, this is going to be doing DSC in the AWS cloud. A lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about will apply to your own DSC deployments. Uh, but the idea is we wanted to get some folks um, that are asking questions from us uh, some references to work with. So I'm going to show you kind of what we put together for them, take you through kind of how it's built, maybe it'll give you some ideas on some of the stuff you're working with. Uh, it's definitely not something to where we're saying this is the way to do it. It's just a reference for our existing customers uh, to kind of get started with things. So I'm going to go through that. And feel free to keep asking questions like yesterday. We had a lot of great uh, questions. Again, my name is Mike Pfeiffer. I'm Solutions Architect at AWS. And uh, so just to give you a little bit of background, what we typically do, um, I talked about the machine images that we have yesterday. We have Windows Server, obviously. We have some <coughs> SQL SKUs for like uh, SQL Web Express Standard. Uh, when customers want to do enterprise products like SQL Enterprise, um, they'll usually come to us. And, you know, they can bring those licenses in and install that software and manage it themselves uh, through BYOL. And uh, you know, if they've got software assurance on their li licenses, they can bring that in and do that kind of stuff. But when we get those kind of questions, uh, usually customers are like, "Okay, we know we can do it. Now, how do we do it?" And the solutions architects at AWS help them with some architectural guidance. Usually we put together something that they can automate and go and test it out. And we use a tool called CloudFormation to do that. And it's essentially an automation orchestration tool. And typically the way it works for the Microsoft stacks is you know, we'll spin up the environment with CloudFormation, spin up all the AWS resources. And when the Windows servers come online, they boot, uh, bootstrap themselves with PowerShell scripts. Right, so what we wanted to do is kind of have kind of a two-fold thing that would answer the question of how can I get started with DSC, but also how can I combine CloudFormation with DSC to kind of do some orchestration, do some deployment, right? So obviously the, the first case scenario for DSC is configuration management. This is kind of using it as a deployment tool, but to give you an end state of, all right, now all these systems are deployed and they're in a configuration where uh, we do have a configuration management platform in place. All right, so that was kind of the idea. Uh, so we're going to look at kind of two scenarios. Um, how can you use CloudFormation and PowerShell DSE to bootstrap those servers, get your applications up and running? The second one is, how can we use AWS resources to do it in a highly available fashion? So we have something called an Elastic Load Balancer in AWS. That's a load balancing service. You can spin that up. It's pretty much managed. Like you can't SSH into it or anything like that. Uh, but you can configure the properties, add the servers that you want in there to be load balanced. So we'll leverage that, uh, point the LCM on all of the client nodes to that endpoint, right? And then we can add them pull their configurations, apply their configurations, and kind of build up the systems that way. Um, so we do have two systems uh, at AWS where we spin up these kind of proof of concept environments. We have something called a test drive. It's built by partners. And then we have something called Quick Starts, where it's built by our teams. And that's where we use CloudFormation quite a bit. So we have a Quick Start for this, and then customers can go in, take the CloudFormation templates, customize it, and kind of do things like that. So essentially what we have in this Quick Start is an environment that is well architected, deployed across multiple availability zones. So remember in a region, those availability zones are like two different data centers. And if you look at like, you know, a kind of enterprise-based stack with some domain controllers, maybe a web tier. We're spreading those across two different AZs. We've got this elastic load balancer in the middle, and then we're configuring all the machines to pull through the ELB against a pull server that's out there. Right? So in this environment, what we're doing is we're bootstrapping the entire environment from scratch. So starting with pull servers, and then rolling everything out. So the pull servers, will get built, and we're kind of using those boxes as a build machine in this scenario. Uh, we're downloading all of the resource modules that we need, maybe a master configuration script that will have node configurations for everything in the deployment, and you know, we'll set up the pull servers, add them to an elastic load balancer, 
And as the rest of these systems come online, they'll point to those endpoints, be able to pull that information down and configure the systems. All right. So to kind of take a step back and talk about CloudFormation, let me just show you what a basic template's gonna look like, and then we'll co cover the rest of this stuff here. All right, oh, that was loud. Okay, so here is a basic CloudFormation template. Let me maximize or kind of crank up the uh, the fonts just a bit so you can see a little better. Let's go to like 150 here. So this is a JSON template. Everything's represented in JSON. All of the resources are put into this. Typically, this is all of the stuff that deploy the AWS resources. But if you really think about it, it's a lot like a script that you would write in PowerShell, right? Up at the top, we have some parameters. So they would launch this template, it would come up in a web form, and then ask them for the inputs. Because uh, if you recall yesterday, we have that default VPC that has a address space of one, uh, 172.16 network. Customers might want to change that, right? So we give them the opportunity to do that. Um, we give them the opportunity to plug in the key pair that they want to use, depending on which region they're launching into. And a couple of other things, like an admin password. Uh, this one actually does a domain controller. And this is a template for just one server. So the parameters are optional, but they're in there to help you configure uh, the system. We have this mapping section that maps the, uh, the images that we were talking about yesterday to the appropriate region. So you could launch the template in any region that you want. It'll just figure out the right Windows image to use. And then if you look down here in the resources, <coughs> this resources block is really it's the only thing that's required in the entire template. The resources are going to contain things like your Windows server, the security group for that server to let the ingress traffic in for whatever you want. So looking at that security group, if you just drill into it, you can see that it's just a group with an ingress rule for remote desktop, right? So pretty straightforward on that. If we look at the actual Windows server, it's got a few more properties. So for the type, we're declaring that this is an EC2 instance. It's, of course, a virtual machine. Inside this instance type property, we can reference the parameter that's up at the top. So the customer can <coughs> change the instance type when they launch the template. Uh, the image is figured out by that mapping. We figure out the right ID to use. And there's other properties in there as well. Another one that's kind of interesting is this user data property. So this is like a configuration script that you could run initially on startup. And generally, you know, this is just a script that's gonna run one time, so it's very hard to bootstrap a complete complex system with just one script, right? So the, the, what the idea is, you can come in here and change these script tags to something like PowerShell. Use a PowerShell tag, and in here, you can actually build out a script. There's an agent on the Windows instance that'll run, take the code that's in there, and then give you a startup script, right? And what that would look like in, in the PowerShell world, and we were doing the command list yesterday. Remember, we were running new EC2 instance. Um, up at the top here, this variable we're declaring is user data. It has to be base64 encoded, but the idea is, you know, you put your PowerShell script, uh, you know, in these little blocks here, and you can put one line, you can do multiple. But again, it's very hard if, you know, you want to build a domain controller, for example, because you want to rename a computer first, right? Then you probably got to reboot, then it comes back up, maybe install some prereqs, promote it through a domain controller, that kind of thing. So that's, the user data is good for small stuff, but CloudFormation lets you take it a little bit further because you can use something called uh, CFN init, attach some additional metadata to those resources, and then you can process more code, you can uh, persist between reboots, so that kind of helps. Uh, so to give you an idea of what I'm talking about here, this actual <coughs> user data script that we're running is initializing that CFN init executable, which says, hey, when this runs, let's go parse this additional metadata that we have, which might be five or six different PowerShell scripts of some kind. So scrolling back up to that resource and actually drilling into this metadata here, you can see that we've got things like files, a files resource or handler, if you will, 
to do some things to configure that CFN in that process so it can keep running every time the system reboots and logs in and all that kind of stuff. And then we have a set of commands, and this is what that process looks at. So command one might be, hey, let's run PowerShell.exe with a command, and it's kind of cut off here, but we're installing prerequisites for <coughs> the Windows features for AD, right? This is a domain controller. The next step is going to come down and rename the computer. That's going to require a reboot. So there's this wait after completion property that says wait forever. So we're not expecting that the next second we can run another command. We know that this is going to reboot it. Wait forever for it to come back up, rerun that CFN init, and let's process the next command, which is installing Active Directory. <coughs> and this one's a little bit more complex because we want to actually use parameters in the template to build that one liner. Okay? So, you know, it's multiple lines here. We're really just joining all of these strings into one command and pulling in data from those, those parameters. Uh, and this is just an install ADDS forest where we're creating a forest and domain and then we're off and running, right? So the idea is we want to use this kind of framework, but we want to use it to use, do, use DSC essentially for some of these future uh, references we're building because um, you know, we want to get people started working with the technology. We also want to use the resources that are coming out more and more that do complex things so we don't have to embed you know, complex scripts in these templates, and we can just make use of the resources that are already there. That makes sense, okay? So this template type of technology, this cloud formation, can take a little while to get your head around and play with, uh, but that's kind of the high level. And I'm gonna take you into the one that does the DS DSC stuff in a little bit more detail. Uh, one other thing to mention about this, though, is you know, we do have another process that says signal success, that runs this <coughs> signal, and it's essentially saying, hey, we've just run four different commands, we want to wait and make sure all those are su uh, successful, and then we want to go back and call into cloud formation and say, okay, we're done, everything's cool, now you can move on to the next piece of the puzzle, whether it's another system that's going to join that domain that we just created, and so on and so forth. Right? We have these little wait handles that kind of facilitate that process, so if you come down here and take a look. We've got, and this is all just for one server, so we have a wait condition that says, I'm gonna wait 1800 seconds. Basically, you're gonna run all those commands that were in that metadata. If we don't get a signal back uh, within this time frame that everything's cool, then it failed. And then in the console, you'll see that, okay, your build failed, something went wrong. And right, so that's kind of the flow. When you look at the big, template that we have that deploys everything. Um, there's going to be one of these for every single server. It's a 300 lines of JSON so far, so when you're doing a fairly complex deployment, you're going to have a lot more lines. Generally, it's a couple thousand for uh, a typical uh, template. Right? Does anybody ever uh, work with confirmation at all? A little bit? Okay. Good. So. This is just a basic one that I wanted to show you. Let me show you launching one, what it looks like. So if you go out to aws.amazon.com slash quickstart, wireless has been rock solid all day up, up until this point. <laughs> Come on. <coughs> Probably have to do that thing right to reconnect to the wireless. Somebody downloading Netflix right now actually probably killing my bandwidth. <laughs> yep. No brainer. Happens every time. The only time I ever get prompted to do this is when I'm up here trying to do this. So again, I'm in room 751. <laughs> if you guys want to hang out later, feel free to swing by. All right. One more try here. 
Okay, so we've got a bunch of different quick starts out there. We've got SAP, we've got SQL Server. We have this one here for PowerShell DSC to launch that environment that I showed in the Visio. But you just click launch. It'll take you into the CloudFormation console. Obviously at this point you would have an AWS account, uh, but it's going to pass in that template and that's actually hosted in, in S3. And when you click next here, it's gonna start prompting you for all of the parameter values. So you might wanna change the networking, you might wanna change the password it's gonna use for the domain admin, put your key pair name in, click next, and then you're off and running. So I'm doing this in, and actually sometimes you wanna check here. It's actually defaulting me to Virginia. I already got stuff running there. I'd actually wanna kick this off in Oregon because I know my key pair is already created there. And it's come through. That's really the only field that you gotta do. You can customize these values if you want, but outside of that, hit next. It'll ask you if you wanna tag this thing. One of the nice things though, just to point out real quick, is if you drill down under advanced, you can say roll back on failure, no. That's good for troubleshooting situations um, because a lot of times, you know, well not a lot of times, but every once in a while, an instance will go to try to grab a download, something will fail and you won't know why. What happens in cloud formation is if there's a failure, it rolls back and deletes all the resources. <laughs> So that's good if you're running an unattended kind of deployment and you don't want to sit there and pay for stuff that's not actually <coughs> functioning. Um, but I, I usually pick no when I'm doing things so I can debug any issues that might have happened here. Uh, but outside of that, you just click next. It goes out, it spins up all those resources. The Windows servers come online. They configure themselves based on uh, the, your DSC configuration that you might have out there. So I ran this. I'm not going to wait for it to run. I already finished this one in Virginia. And then what happens is, if everything went well, you'll get a green create complete. Uh, but as it's building, you'll see under this events tab, everything that's going on along the way. And if it did fail, you, you'd see it in here. Uh, and then you can kind of figure out what happened. One of the things that I'm working on is trying to use more strict error handling in our bootstrapping <coughs> scripts and all that kind of stuff. So you know, exceptions, things like that will pop up in this console. Uh, that natively doesn't, doesn't work too well. Uh, so, that's something that helps in the troubleshooting process as well. But that's kind of a high level. That's what we're using is the orchestration piece, and then everything else is, is, is DSC that we're relying on, okay? So obviously the benefits to this is just, you know, full configuration management from the infrastructure side of the house. So you've got this declarative JSON template for the AWS resources, and then you've got your configuration scripts for all of your DSC stuff. So. That's the big benefit there. It's, you know, infrastructure is code. Everything can be version controlled and it's a fairly descriptive build document for everything that you're trying to do. So we, we do have two templates for this uh, quick start that we try to put out there for people. The pull mode obviously is good for proof, proof of concept, people that want to go out, see what a pull server infrastructure is like, play around with it a little bit. Uh, we'll have a push model as well. So that's what I see us using as the future for for the other stuff that we're doing. Uh, obviously customers are using CloudFormation and PowerShell to just do builds on their own, uh, but on our teams, we'll probably use the push mode type of model uh, going forward, especially as more resources uh, start, to start to come out in the, uh, in the field and all that good stuff. But uh, what we're gonna do to bootstrap the pull server infrastructure is, again, we'll use AWS CloudFormation for all the AWS resources. Uh, we're going to use CloudFormation to tag every single instance with a GUID. So every single EC2 instance will have a unique GUID, and that'll kind of be the source of authority for GUIDs. So on the pull servers, we'll be able to figure out what do we rename the MOF files to so they can be pulled from the appropriate instance. Uh, and the instance itself, when it goes to configure the LCM, can just look at its GUID tag and figure out, oh, okay, <coughs> this is my GUID, this is what it should be up on the pull server as well, and that's kind of how we're matching it up there. Uh, again, like I was saying, the, the pull server itself is going to be the build server in this scenario. Uh, and that's just to minimize the amount of machines somebody would need to use to, to get this all up and running. Um, and then from there, um, <coughs> all remaining instances after that first pull server comes online uh, will start configuring themselves by talking to the pull server. Uh, so just real quick, looking in the console over here under EC2 in Virginia, if we scroll down, on the left and take a look at my load balancers. This is my load balancer. Um, and again, this is just kind of a, a managed service. You're gonna get a DNS name here that's going to use an internal 
uh, namespace that's specific to the VPC. Since the uh, load balancer can cover multiple availability zones, the IP can change, right, if there's a failover on one side or something like that. And there's other times, too, where we can change the IP. So there's this big disclaimer here saying, don't figure out what the IP is and then create your own A records that point to that because it could change. What you'd want to do is use a C name record that points to this crazy name that we've got here. And it's dynamic based on the name of the stack. But the challenge is, is when you're bootstrapping everything from scratch and the pull servers go first, right, you don't have active dir directory DNS, or something where you can create your own CNAME records. The DNS that runs inside uh, VPC is pretty much non-managed. That's just kind of something to get you up and running and get you internet access. So initially, when we're doing this reference, we're bootstrapping and using this actual internal name uh, for the endpoint for the pull server. So you see that in the, in the local community configuration manager uh, configuration. But notice I got my two instances in service. Those are the two pull servers. Uh, we're doing health checks on those. So you'll see those guys in here. You can see that they're in two different availability zones, USDs 1A and 1C. And for a health check, we're just kind of doing a TCP ping on port 8080 to make sure that thing's still alive. All right? And if it's not, obviously we start sending people over uh, or nodes over to the one that's available. All right? There we go. <clears throat> so the configuration script does quite a bit, and I'll show you guys the code. But uh, you know, what we wanted to do was do a few things with CloudFormation just to kind of bootstrap the environment. Uh, but by and large, we want DSC to do all the work in this in this deployment. So creating the Active Directory domain at Forest on the first server, um, and another thing we want to do is configure AD site topology especially in a, a multi-data center or a multi-AZ environment because you can't span those availability zones with a single subnet. Each one's going to have its own subnet. And generally with Microsoft Enterprise deployments, uh, we typically assign an AD site to each data center or each AZ. Uh, so as you guys probably know, uh, you'd like to take advantage of client affinity. So servers in the same availability zone as a domain controller would primarily talk to that local domain controller unless there's a time where it needs to go across site and talk to somebody else. So that's something that we added a couple of custom resources for. Um, you know, there's that great uh, X Active Directory resource that was out there that will create the domain and all that stuff for you. Um, but there wasn't anything in there to set up uh, some additional sites and then map subnets to those sites. So we just added a couple of different um, small resources to accommodate that scenario. Uh, one of the things that you know that I found there is uh, it's worth it to kind of crack that open and go that extra mile when it doesn't do exactly what you want it to do because it takes you deeper into into DSC and kind of gets you understanding uh, you know hey this is how custom resources work and it was worth the extra effort even though that support wasn't initially there so it's a good way to to kind of go a little bit deeper and I know you guys are working on custom resources last night you probably already have realized that right so. Uh, but you know, from there, we also join each node to the domain after it's created, create that second domain controller. Um, and then from there, we're just setting up IIS servers for a basic web application. We're setting up a couple of remote desktop gateways for remote management, all right? Uh, in terms of bootstrapping the pull servers, I touched quickly on IAM roles yesterday. Um, and that's that piece of the puzzle that lets you authenticate and call APIs uh, and talk to EC2 and get information for that or any service for that matter. Um, what we want to do is have the ability of the pull servers to query into the service to figure out you know, what are those GUID tags on those virtual machines so we can uh, configure that appropriately. We can rename the MAW files to match those GUIDs. Uh, so we create an IAM role with a very limited set of permissions that says I can only call and read uh, that information. Right, so it's a limited set of permissions. Um, in terms of helper scripts and things like that, we download that from S3. So S3 is our object storage, basically accessing files via HTTP. Uh, we are using self-signed certificates just for demo purposes, you know, just to show that you know, SSL and, and that kind of thing is a best practice. Not necessarily a best practice to use self-signed certificates. 
something that you should replace after the fact. Um, but that's something that we threw in there as well. And then the final process of bootstrapping full server is just get the DSC web service installed and then take that big configuration script that has a node configuration for everything in the environment, run that, produce MOFs for it, rename the files as needed, kind of move everything around. <laughs> also, since the pull server is building all the MOFs, we need to have the modules that are required um, to be extracted as well on that box. Right? So I'll, I'll show you what that uh, template looks like here. So this one's a little bit more, a little bit more going on in this one. So we have a few more parameters at the top. Can you guys read that? Or is that a little small? Small. 150 is a little bit. Let me try 125. <coughs> that help a little bit? So again, we got the key pair. We've got some instance types. Um, we're letting people, again, control the, the CIDR um, blocks for all of their subnets and all that good stuff. The actual IP addresses for full servers, domain controllers. So they can plug all of that in. So the parameter is obviously pretty straightforward. Uh, scrolling down into the actual nodes. And then the difference between this one and the other one that I showed is we're actually building out all the network infrastructure. So you know, that other template that I showed would launch the domain controller into the default VPC with that address space you might not be interested in. You know, so <laughs> you can carve that up here. If you change it, we'll create a new VPC for you. And that's what all of this stuff uh, here under resources is. You know, we're creating D DMZ subnets, private subnets, all the route tables to make all the networking work within there. And then we get down into the actual resources. So scrolling down, here's the first pull server. <coughs> so notice that uh, we are using a depends on attribute right under the type for the EC2 instance. So we're basically saying, hey, as soon as the NAT instance comes online and we know that we've got outbound internet access, uh, then we're good to start creating the server. Now, the reason for that is that the CloudFormation endpoint is outside the VPC, so you need to be able to have internet access to get out and you know, continue to run that CFN init process and figure out, hey, what's the next block of code I need to run after every reboot, right? And then we're kind of carving it up into different config sets. And this is just a way for it to kind of logically organize the code that's gonna run. Um, but you know, we have one for basic setup, which is gonna involve downloading modules, helper scripts, things like that. Uh, we have a portion that bootstraps the full service, builds the configs, and then that finalized piece that goes and tells CloudFormation, hey, we're done, we're signaling success, and we're moving on to the next step here. But we take a look a little bit further down. For the files, here's all the stuff we're downloading. Uh, you can see that this is kind of like a files resource in a way that you'd see in a, in a DSC configuration. Uh, some of these ones at the top, CFN autoloader, that's just to keep CFN persisting and running. Uh, but you know, we're downloading the modules here, like XPS desired state configuration, X networking, X computer management, X active directory, uh, because we're gonna not only need to extract all of those, um, but we're also gonna need to put them in the modules folder for download and check some of them so they're available to all those other nodes. So we don't want the modules to have to be on the individual nodes, right? We want to use the download <laughs> capability through the pull server. So that's where we're putting the majority of the stuff on here, okay? One of the things I did run into though that, that kind of threw me one, at one point is I don't remember which version it was of the X Active Directory uh, resource, but it had a dash instead of the underscore right before the version. And if it has a dash, what I found is that the nodes would not pull down, like even if you check some and zip file the right way and all that stuff, it wouldn't pull down uh, the resource module and, and, and do anything from there. So the operational <laughs> log, I believe, uh, is what led me to figure out what the problem was there. It was just a matter of renaming that. So watch out for that. If it's not named proper, that's something you could run into. All right. Uh, but that's the files piece of just kind of getting that initial uh, section bootstrapped. Once we get into here, uh, we're creating a pull server. So we have one script uh, that creates the pull server, very similar to what you've seen uh, you know, in the DSC book on logs on the PowerShell team blog. Nothing exotic going on inside there. Uh, and then, of course, the next command is going to be to check some of the resources. So you can see that we basically just loop through all the zip files in there and run new DSC checksum. So they're available for download at that point. 
moving down a little further, we actually run our master configuration script, and then we're passing all the parameters from the CloudFormation template into the master config, and that's going to define what's the domain name going to be for Active Directory, what's the IP spaces we're going to use for everything, what's the IP address for pull servers, domain controllers, all that kind of good stuff. All right. Finally, after we get down from there, there's this last piece that we added in the finalized block called, uh, where we're using a custom module. Command right here is called write AWS quick start status. The reason I, I'm kind of using this new pattern is the issue that I talked about earlier, where we're not seeing errors on instances in the CloudFormation console. Because the CloudFormation console is going to give you errors about AWS resource issues. It's not going to give you information about issues on the Windows box. So what we're doing with this function is really just figuring out, because we're actually keeping track of errors as they happen. If they do, we're writing them into the registry. If there are any, this thing will run, get the error count. If it's higher than zero, we'll run that CFN signal and say, hey, it failed. We'll actually send the exception information up so you see it in the CloudFormation console. And They'll tell you the script that uh, ran, it was broken, the commandlet uh, that was the problem there too. Uh, so that can kind of save some time, uh, give the ability to fail fast and not sit there for an hour while, while somewhere, something was broken all along. All right? So that's kind of the bootstrapping process on that pull server. In terms of bootstrapping the clients, again, those guys are getting an IAM role so they can query their own tags. So we can run git ec2 instance, figure out what the GUID tag is for that instance. And then we, when we go to configure the LCM, tell it, you know, what's the endpoint for the pull server? What's my configuration ID supposed to be? We're able to pull that out of EC2. So it's just a tag on the virtual machine. Um, we do, do some things here by copying the certificate around because we are using that self-signed certificate. So we're using HTTPS for the pull server endpoint. We're also using the same certificate for encrypting credentials. Um, so it's kind of nice not to have uh, plain text password and the MOS that are, that are generated. Uh, so we're doing that there as well. Again, folks will really want to replace that with their own PKI type of solution uh, to do that kind of thing. Right. Uh, and just switching back over that template, we can look at like the domain controller, for example and look at the bootstrapping process for that guy. So if we look at maybe DC1, right? Uh, we got config sets for that. They run through a various set of scripts. Here we're downloading less files because, I mean, the key one here is gonna be the set pull mode.ps1 that goes through and configures the LCM. Um, we've got a couple helper scripts to grab uh, the certificates. And then we get in here and then essentially we just run set pull mode pass in the instance name, specify the region, and that's how the script knows to go in and query, figure out what the GUID's supposed to be, figure out what the elastic load balancer endpoint is supposed to be uh, when you configure it. So looking at the set pull mode script here, let's get rid of that. Got a couple parameters there, but this uh, line six, that's where we're getting the GUID. I kind of showed that yesterday when you run git ec2 instance with the filter, uh, but we're really just figuring out, um, based on the name of the server that's being passed in by the instance parameter, what's the actual GUID going to be? And we're storing it in that GUID variable. And if you scroll down a little bit to the right here, you can see that we're just using that where method on the tags collection to find the GUID tag. All right. We're also using the, the uh, get ELB load balancer uh, commandlet to figure out the endpoint for that. But just to give you a, a visual on that, just connect into the domain controller. This is an environment that was already built using all this stuff. And this guy's got that IAM role that basically just lets him read very specific information out of EC2. world's longest login. I think I used the smallest instant type for this one. That's why it's running a little slow. It's not so much of the world like you think it's for a long time. It hasn't 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. We're not done yet, right? This might eat up into the last of the 40 mi 45 minutes. Come on, you could do it. While I'm waiting on that, let me show you that the role looks like the IAM role. So remember I told you guys yesterday I have a user uh, named Mike, and that's where I was using those access keys. I gave him a role that's full-blown admin access. <coughs> the actual roles that you assign to the instances uh, are listed in here. For example, this is uh, the one that I had in my template. And if you look at the actual policy, essentially we're just saying, you know, for elastic load balancers, let us describe those. And for EC2 instances, let me describe those. So describe is really just a get. So we don't want you to be able to create stuff. We don't want you to be able to change anything. We just want you to be able to pull that information. So here we go, it finally came up. Uh, so I'd run this earlier, just looking at the local configuration manager. You can see that the value for the server URL is the actual DNS name of the elastic load balancer. Since we're using HTTPS, it's important that we're actually using that FQDN, right? Could I use an IP address there if I'm doing HTTPS? Would that work? It's a tricky question, right? So you got to trust the certificate, right? When you're doing self-sign, that's hard to do because you got to copy it into the trusted root store. Um, if you're using your own PKI, that's a little bit easier. But if you're doing HTTPS as well for the server URL, you have to make sure you're using an FQDN. The name has to match what's on the common name field of, of the certificate, or else it won't it won't download anything. It won't configure itself. So that's something to watch out for there. But um, remember when I said yesterday, if you run get AWS credentials and list your credentials, that would store your profile information <coughs> so you could connect. Right now, I've got no profile configured. But what I can do is I can run get ELB load balancer, specify the region. And it will come back with the information, even though I didn't provide credentials, because it's getting it from that IAM role. And what we do is we, that's, we call that temporary credentials. We rotate the credentials every six hours. That way the box can run an application. It can run PowerShell scripts like this and still get access to those very specific roles that you configured uh, in that IAM service. All right, so that's how it's kind of figuring out all of this information. So. I wanted to move a little fast on this one because I ran out of time yesterday. <laughs> so I just want to open it up for questions and show you guys uh, any other code in here that you want to see uh, or, or anything like that. I think the master configuration script might be a good one to look at. Um, I still got a few minutes. So again, this is a parameterized script, right? These are all the same parameters that are in that cloud formation template. So this is going to be the master configuration script that has a node configuration for everything in the deployment. Uh, so we're pulling. And this would be running on the full server, right? It's going to do a MOF for every single server. We're getting the DNS name for that load balancer. I've got a couple of configuration scripts for just helper functions to do some things. I've got my configuration data in here, which you know helps us get the node out of EC2 for each, each individual node, helps us figure out what availability zone they're in. So we've got AZ1 and AZ2, depending on where the server is. And the reason that uh, we do that is that uh, you know, this particular piece under our configuration where uh, we're using that X DNS server address resource. Because ideally, you know, if you're an AZ1, uh, or yeah, an AZ1, we want you to point to <coughs> the domain controller running DNS in AZ1 primarily, and the one in the other availability zone second. And vice versa, if your server is an AZ2, you, you'd like to flip that, right? Uh, one of the things that broke all this for me the other day at the last minute is we just did an AMI update. And um, basically when they update the AMI, they just put the patches on there, they sysprep it, and then you know it's still just a base OS. But in this case, the actual interface alias changed. So it was Ethernet, and I had that in my script. And then it changed the Ethernet 3, because uh, they changed the drivers for the Nix. And uh, so I ran it, and it blew up on me. And it took me a few minutes to figure out what was going on. Um, but that was what the issue was. And fortunately, just went into the operational log in there for uh, DSC configuration on the node, told me exactly what the issue was. So uh, luckily, that is logged very well. Just remember to look there first, basically, if you're having issues uh, applying a configuration. 
the other thing with domain controllers, um, I've run into a lot of issues over the years with domain controllers by not uh, statically assigning the IP address. Um, especially when you have domain controllers in the distributed environment, multiple sites, and you're trying to do replication and things like that. Um, the XIP um, resource does a very good job at setting a static IP, but if you've already assigned it via DHCP, it'll basically do a check and say, oh, you already have that IP, and then it'll just skip it. It won't set it statically, if that makes sense. All right, so um, not really a big deal, but we, we did want to make sure it was static. We still want to continue to use DSC resources. So we just customized that resource. It was like two lines in that resource. We just went in there and said, hey, if it's dynamic, but the, you still got the ad address you want, go ahead and set it static. All right, so it's a fairly easy fix, but something that ran into, um, that can, you know, cause a little bit of a headache. Uh, the things I've seen with domain controllers having diff uh, dynamic IPs is weird replication issues, uh, servers not registering, uh, SRV records, things like that. So that's kind of the story behind that. Uh, and then the rest of the configuration is fairly straightforward. You know, we're, we're doing the installation of the, uh, the bits for Active Directory. Uh, we're using the depends on to make sure that the AD tools are installed before we try to create the domain for us. And then here's where we started adding in some of those custom resources where we configure site topology, map subnets to those sites, uh, and things like that. So probably the DC resource uh, configuration for this node is the most um, <laughs> The most verbose, I would say, and then the ones from there, um, you know, we joined the second domain controller uh, and kind of go from there. Uh, one thing to note, you probably see for the default gateway and the subnet mask, we're using these helper functions, and the reason for that is that the customer can put whatever they want in the parameters when they launch it. So, you know, they could use a an eight bit mask for their VPC and sixteen bit masks for their subnets, or they could use sixteen bit mask for the VPC and a twenty four bit subnet for the others. Uh, and the thing is that the subnet mask on this resource is not represented like a traditional 255.255.255.0. It's actually represented in, uh, in subnet uh, bits, right, and mask bits. So these are just helpers to kind of figure that out based on what they input. And the good thing is, is you know, you can have that logic in here when you generate the MOP, and it's just going to be static information. So, so that leaves me with about five minutes, guys. Um, the only last information I would say that's you know, really of any kind of interest is at the bottom where we, we run the configuration, uh, we store the output, right? we pass our configuration, store the output in that file. That way we can kind of go through and figure out, okay, DC1 is supposed to be this GUID, DC2 is supposed to be the other GUID. And we just rename the files accordingly and move them over to the right folder on the pull server, check some of them, and then we're off and running. And that's pretty much how that one works. And, and like I said, the, the pull server template uh, is, is good, definitely for a proof of concept. You're trying to figure out doing pull servers and how to do them highly available. Uh, but I think for most of our quick starts going forward, we'll just leverage the, the new resources that continue to come out, and we'll kind of use that push mode, where the resources look at bootstrap, like cloud formation, and they'll have their one configuration script for that node, potentially, or maybe they'll all have a master one, depending on the scenario. Uh, but we'll probably leverage that because not every single customer is going to want pull servers, so that's probably how we'll go forward with it. Uh, but with that, that's pretty much all I had on that. Four minutes left for questions. Were you able to, um, did you have any success trying to like, do a pull request for the XIP for the changes you made? Um, it did It did work. Um, so it, it did run and say, yeah, everything's cool. Uh, because what we did in CloudFormation is we actually tell the IP we want to have. So it, that effectively creates a, a reservation in VPC's DHCP. So the server will always get that IP, um, but it doesn't actually do anything in Windows. But what the resource saw was that, okay, it does have the desired IP, and now we're just, we're good. Did so, you try submitting the resource itself back to the GitHub repo? Or? Yeah, that one I did actually change, and then I, I submitted a pull request, and Steve, I think, merged it in uh, a couple <laughs> weeks ago. The ones that I wrote for the, uh, the domain controller stuff I have not done yet, but I will do. And those could probably use some extra stuff because um, I only put one extra one to configure the site link configuration just for my particular scenario. So we probably need another resource to do multiple site links. And I'm planning on uh, trying to get that out there as well. So. We good? All right, guys, really appreciate it. Let me talk. Thanks.
Oh, I gotta hit the red button, right? Yeah.